duty, honor, country dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. The destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. Now, we are the masters of our fate. Howdy, gents. Welcome back to another episode of the Wolf and Iron podcast. I'm your host, Mike Yarbrough, founder and curator of wolfandiron.com. Well, men, one of the things that you'll notice if you've been listening to the Wolf and Iron podcast for any point in time, or you've been checking out any of the other content that I've been putting out, is that I'm always trying to get us to think. I want us to think about why we do what we do. Why do we keep living our lives the same way? And is there a better way to do things? Not surprisingly, the answer is oftentimes yes, there is a better way. And In order to pursue that, it means we've got to make some changes in our lives. We've got to do some things that other people aren't doing and probably some things that we've never done ourselves. We've got to break away from the status quo and start taking the road less traveled. My guest today is somebody who's done that, who talks about that. His name is Joel Salatin. And some of you guys know him from the the movie Food, Inc. Uh, Maybe you've read his book, uh, one of his books actually called Folks, This Ain't Normal. He calls himself a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer, which is probably the best title any of my guests have ever had. And, uh, and it really suits him very well because he is. And he very much espouses a connection to the land that people aren't used to, a way of thinking about how we eat, why, the way we do things in many areas in life, not just in our food, but how, that, how our lack of knowledge around agriculture and farming, and our lack of connection back to just the visceral world that we we should be part of really impacts us in a negative way. And so today we have a great conversation. Not only do we talk about how he does things on his farm, Polyface Farms, which is really, really unique, and you guys are going to dig this so much, but we also talk about the things that we're not getting and we need to be getting from just simple living, getting back to the basics, getting our hands dirty, really valuing hard work again. At the end of the episode, I asked Joel a question that you guys are going to be asking probably the whole time through, and that is, how do I begin to make these changes in my life? Suburban America, how do I begin to make changes in my own family so that I don't perpetuate a generational ignorance and we just keep doing the same thing that we've always done generation after generation? And he answers that question very, very well. So you guys stay tuned to the end. And without further ado, here's Joel Salatin. Mr. Joel Salatin, it is an absolute honor to be speaking to you today. Thank you so much for coming on the Wolf and Iron podcast. Oh, thank you, Mike. It's uh, great to be with you. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, my wife and I, we read one of your books, Folks, This Ain't Normal. We read this a few years back, and we've been quoting this to our friends and and to people for for a number of years. So when we try to convert people over to your way of thinking, uh, we we always send them to your book first because it's just a great common sense, but also very, um, it's practical, but it's also very broad in terms of just the, the scope of what the book is about. And so I think people might see it and see a chicken on the front and go, okay, I'm not a farmer, but they got to understand it's a lot more than that. And, uh, and so I appreciate that. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to create that book and to get that out there. Uh, thank you. Well, it was, a it was an interesting, uh, uh, writing project. It's, it's one of the only books that, um, that I've written that, that somebody asked me to write about. In other words, it didn't just, you know, uh, come out from the inside. So it was a, a little bit of a hard book to write uh, it, because it wasn't, um, it didn't well up from my inner being, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, but I, I'm glad I did. I wrestled with all those topics, and it was great to, great to get them uh, codified. And um, and it's had it's had uh, it's had good good success. And and the people who have read it um, have for the most part, had your same experience. It, you know, it, it's, it's, more, it's, more than, it's more than you think when you look at the title. You know, it's, it's more than you think. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I think that's, I see that you've written a number of how-to books, and obviously this goes beyond that. And I think this is a much more difficult kind of book to write because it does bring in all the cultural things that are going on, and you make some very strong statements. And so, um, so just well done again. Um, so for the guys who haven't read your book and may not be familiar with you, uh, or may, maybe people who know a little bit about you know you through Polyface Farms or something, give us a give us a description of yourself and kind of the mission that you're on and the, the things that you're doing today. 
Sure. Well, we farm in uh, Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, and uh, I've been here since I was four years old. Mom and Dad uh, came to the farm in 1961, and um, I came back to the farm full-time September 24, 1982. And uh, my wife and I, uh, uh, Teresa, we have two kids. They're in their uh, 30s now, and um, we have three grandkids. My mom is dad is deceased but mom is still a very active 93 year old here <laughs> on the farm so with our grandkids who are 13 uh 13 11 and 9 uh, we have four generations on the farm which is really really cool yeah uh so we you know we live here work together we you know we grow uh pastured livestock and we direct market to about 5,000 families 50 restaurants farmers markets some uh some uh you know uh more supermarket uh, traditional facades as well and um and it's a yeah it, it's a not a backyard deal anymore. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty significant uh pretty significant thing yes and so you know listening to that description i'm, I'm kind of picturing you know typical farmer guy uh you know basically just has his life there on the farm but you've done something far beyond that you're actually making an impact on the agricultural community and and how people think about food uh, in general. And uh, you do some things with regenerative farming. Tell us a little bit about how that kind of process works. I know there's a lot of details there, but just give us kind of an overview. Sure. Well, my grandfather, my dad's dad, was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine when it was first published in 1949. And uh, dad uh, got his, you know, ecological bent from him and I got it from dad. And so I grew up in this uh, kind of amazing world where, you know, uh, where religiously as, as, as Christians, you know, we, we went to a pretty fundamental kind of, uh, uh, fellowship group and then, but on the farm, <laughs> all of our friends were, you know, hippie, uh, yeah. uh, beaded, bearded, braless, uh, you know, um, compost, compost, uh, developers. And so I kind of lived in this, in this, um, you know, uh, tension, if you will, uh, all my life. And, and now it's, it's, it suited me very well, uh, because I see myself as this bridge between this, the environmental, mm -hmm. uh, creation worshipers who are my friends and the, you know, the creator worshipers who need to be touched with this right. idea of, of creation stewardship. And, um, and so I, I can, I can, I, I feel equally both at home and foreign in both of those worlds. So, you know, a couple, several years ago, um, for to have fun with this tension and, and stereotypes, uh, pigeonholing, I just kind of made myself a moniker, a Christian libertarian <laughs> environmentalist capitalist lunatic farmer. And, and uh, that way, when I get into these groups, um, uh, you know, I, I, we, we can smile and laugh about it as opposed to, you know, feeling frustrated about the, the tensions uh, in my life. And so uh, we basically looked at, at patterns, um, God's order, if you will. What, how does nature work? How does ecology work? And how can we mimic that on a commercial domestic production model? And so uh, there, there, there really aren't a lot of complicated things. Now, you know, I mean, they're, they're sophisticated. But if you look at nature, you know, one of the things you see is um, that there mm -hmm. is no animalist ecosystem, so there's animals everywhere, uh, and, and, and those animals move. They're not confined in structures or buildings. They, they actually move. And, and so if animals move, then we have to have portable infrastructure. We have to control them because the neighbors don't want them. We have to be able to protect them. We have to be able to get water to them. And so then you move into mobile infrastructure as an outgrowth of mobile animals. And and of course, all the animals have different dietary uh, desires. And there's no, you know, there's no uh, herbivore in nature that eats manure feathers and, uh, and, and dead meat. And so, you know, when the, when the uh, orthodoxy of our day mm -hmm. uh, said, you know, feed dead cows to cows, we didn't buy into that, not because, not because we knew there was going to be mad cow later on, but because we, we honored an order that was very, very clear. We looked around the globe and said, well, where is the herbivore that eats meat or meat eats carrion? And we couldn't find it. So, yeah. so for us, that's enough. That, that's enough just to 
appreciate the, the pattern. We don't have sure. to know all about it. Well, then, of course, you know, you know what happened 30 years later, uh, there's mm-hmm. this big global, you know, oops, maybe we should not have done that, right, with uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And so we take it very seriously that God set up this amazing design, this amazing order, and it's up to us to study that and then apply it in a practical, visceral uh, workout way. Big picture here for us is that we view physical creation as an object lesson of spiritual truth. So, so what we want is our customers and visitors and stuff, we want them to leave the farm and say, oh, I've just seen neighborliness. Oh, I've just seen faith. Uh, I've just seen forgiveness. I've just seen abundance. I've just seen you know all these wonderful big uh, spiritual truths. We see the physical creation as as essentially an object lesson to bring those forth. And so our moniker is healing the healing the land one bite at a time. We're connecting the dots between. Uh, between what we eat and the landscape our children will inherit. For the Christian community, we would say, does what you say in the menu, I mean, I'm sorry, does what you believe in the pew match up with what you're seeing on the menu? Mm, yeah. So, it, uh, so that's so good. And that's it's exactly where we're going to be going with this episode is talking about how that connection with uh, with real things with the land and, and seeing actual work being done and uh, and in that sort of environment in that community is going to make a big change. And we've lost a lot of things because we don't have that. But it really does change how people view, really, their, their worldview, their life. But one of the things I wanted to ask before we jump over to that is when you were, when you were putting these systems in place, these this regenerative farming and stuff, was this a big uh, – I'm sure it happened in, gradually. But were they big, um, big changes? Like was this – you know, what I'm trying to say here is, was it a potentially this could kill the farm, this could ruin everything if we do this, or was it a, you know what, we just believe in it and it's going to work and let's just let's just go with it? I mean, how how did those this regenerative farming come about over time? And you know, was it met with skepticism and that kind of stuff? Were you were you really that much of a, an outsider? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, we were we were very much heretics, uh, and and. I wouldn't say that we were scared that it wouldn't work because we were we were completely committed to you know to um, you know to the models that we thought uh, would work and and of course and we're not the only ones doing this we we do it probably as big and as intricately as anybody does uh, but we certainly we we have borrowed you know there are very few new things under the sun and so uh, we borrowed from from different people. And um, so, so Dad, you know, I'm, I'm at the stage. I'm 60, and so, you know, I'm at that point where uh, uh, the older I get, the the smarter Dad was. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and and so uh, he realized early on that as a small farm, we he viewed the chemical approach, whether it's chemical fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, whatever. He viewed that as an approach as essentially a drug addiction. You 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 have to you you know you have to get uh, um, more concentrated doses, bigger doses to get the same hit. I mean, call it what you will, yeah. but essentially you're on this you're on this essentially treadmill. And he said, you, know, you 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 can't get out of this. And so very early on, uh, when we first came, you know, he actually had consultants out, both public and private. Said, how do I make a living on this farm? And every one of them. Their advice was, you know, plant corn, build silos, borrow more money, you know, uh, graze, graze the forest, you know, all this stuff. Well, his, his ecological integrity said, you know, that can't be right. It's God stuff. It, it, it's God stuff. And these gullies and these ditches and the topsoil eroding, yeah. that's not a good return on investment for, for God's stuff. And so, we, so what we have to be doing is building soil. Well, how does, how does nature build soil? Well, nature builds soil. Mm-hmm. primarily with perennials and herbivores and all the deep soils, you know, the prairies, the, the, um, uh, you know, Mongolia, the, the pampas of Argentina, all the great, uh, uh, deep soils of the planet were built under, under prairies with herbivores. And, um, so we started there. Well, how do these herbivores function? Well, they move, they don't stay in the same place. 
well, how do we move them? We have this farm. We we can't we can't do the 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 uh, migratory choreography uh, north, south, east, west. Oh, portable electric fence. So the portable electric fence gave us a steering wheel, a brake, and accelerator on that herbivorous pruner of the biomass so that we could steer the herbivore around the landscape with the same precision that you would wield a pair of uh, pruning shears in an orchard or, or a zero-turn mower on a golf course. This is, this, is what, this is what happens in nature with, you know, 7 million herd of buffalo uh, being chased by wolves or, or, you know, moving around with fire. That, that same thing happens. We just miniaturized it with high-tech infrastructure. Wow. So that, that kind of stuff is just so fascinating to me. Um, and I know, I know the guys are listening to this going, that's brilliant. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, why does every farm not do this? This is smart. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then, so then, you know, as, as things went and, and, but you're, you're right. You know, none of this is done in, in one fell swoop. You, you do one thing. It's like, it's like all things in life. You, um, if you have this, this epiphanal moment, you know, where you say, oh, wow, uh, I want to. I want to think differently in this in this little thing, and you do it, and you find it soul satisfying. Then quickly you're rubbing your head, right, and you're looking around, saying, "Well, that was cool." Uh, you know, I wonder what else that's unorthodox would satisfy me better than orthodoxy. And so, so that that's where you find somebody, you know, um, you know, a, a family that decides, for example, to homeschool and finds it very satisfying. They like what they're seeing in their kids. Blah blah blah. They say. Oh well, what else am I missing? The next thing you know, you know, they've got a cow in the backyard and a, a grain <laughs> mill on, on the kitchen sink, and they're going and they're going to a homeopath instead of a you know a, a regular a doctor. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and so you see this you see this progression. I I call it the natural progression of the narrow way. Mm. If you enter the narrow way and you find it just uh, well, I'll just say satisfying. If you find that satisfying then very quickly you start looking at those narrow ways in education, in entertainment, in, in lifestyle, in vocation, in uh, you know, medicine and, and, and wellness and whatever, and, and you just you know, start down that road. And so that's the way it was for us. We got the cows moving around. Well, when we look at nature and say, well, well how did God set this up? Mm-hmm. Before Merck Pharmaceuticals and Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson, with, with you know grubicides and parasiticides to to keep the cows healthy, well, how did God set it up? And you you look at around at the world and you say, well, birds, birds follow herbivores. You know the egret on the rhino's nose, the yeah. the birds following the Cape buffalo in Botswana. I mean, birds, these these huge you know bunch of birds. So uh, we put together a portable uh, chicken house. We call it the Eggmobile. And so now 800 chickens, we have a pair of them, they're hooked together like a train, and we can move them around behind the cows. The chickens scratch through the cow patties, eat out the fly larva to keep the flies down, and, and, and of course, the cow grazing um, uh, exposes the grasshoppers and crickets, which the chickens then also eat, debug, sanitize the pasture, and turn all that into eggs, which we can sell. So instead of spending money and time on, 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 uh, on pharmaceuticals, uh, we're actually collecting $100,000 worth of eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation system. So, so these, these systems, while they are intricate, they're not complex. They, they're, they're, they're relationally uh, uh, intricate, and, and, mm-hmm. and yet, yet they're synergistic. And so fundamentally, we're looking at systems that are integrated rather than segregated. You know, the average farm raises one thing, does only one thing, and, and the inputs come from somewhere else, and the product goes somewhere else, whereas for us, um, we're wanting to close all those loops. The waste stream of one becomes the feedstock of the next one, and you just have these waves, basically, these, these cyclical waves rolling over our place so that, um, uh, so that we, can, we can harvest or leverage more and more of the natural resources day by day. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And I'll say for the guys that are listening to this, if you've if you've only had just uh, the the regular store bought grain fed eggs, and you've never had real eggs from chickens that are just you know roaming around eating what chickens eat, you're missing out. It's like yellow gold. It's awesome. <laughs> yes, 
That's right. That, I mean, we, we say you are what you eat. Well, you're also, the permutation of that is you are what you eat. eat. <laughs> That's right. That's That's, nice. it, it, goes, it goes one step further. And the thing is that the biological world, I mean, you have to realize that I, I've, I've written a book, I don't know if you've seen it or not, uh, The Marvelous Bigness of Pigs, uh, Nurturing and Caring for All God's Creation. And it's essentially a, a, a Christian uh, um, mm -hmm. a creation stewardship ethic, if you will. Uh, and and one of the uh, chapters in there is biological versus mechanical. And, and, and you know, we view... Um, the we view life mm -hmm. life as fundamentally biological as opposed to mechanical but in our culture my in our culture we view life i mean we i mean our culture views life as fundamentally mechanical not biological and um, and, and so you know it, it's simply parts and pieces I, I think it's one of the one of the most uh, fascinating confluences in history is 1837 that's the year that Cyrus McCormick invented the Reaper, which is supposedly the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's the year that Justice von Liebig in Austria, um, uh, you know, wowed the world with his vacuum tube experiments and said all of life is just a rearrangement of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, NPK. And it's the same year that Charles Darwin set sail on the Beagle and told us that God didn't have anything to do with creation. And so the confluence of the, of the industrial revolution, the machinery, the mechanical view of life, and taking God out of creation, that confluence literally convulsed the planet in a new ideology, a new thinking toward, toward everything. And so those of us who are coming here, you know, almost 200 years after that, after that uh, con convulsive confluence, can we say that? Those are big words all uh, put together. But those of us who are coming this far after that, we, we literally, uh, we literally are, are brain damaged in, in, in thinking, you know, compared to our, you know, 400 year ago uh, ancestors and just how they, how they viewed things. And, um, and, and so we have to really uh, aggressively, what can I say, uh, you know, uh, protect ourselves or fight against um, the tendency to to adopt all that you know all that uh, kind of new thinking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're still feeling the the effects of that. We're still seeing it, and that's obviously that's what you're fighting against. And in many ways, that's some of the things that I, that's a, a an ongoing conversation that I have here on Wolf and Iron because you know guys are going to work, they're doing the the eight to five job, and you know they're this is just what we do, right? This is just, this is just how we, you know, don't break the cycle. Just keep doing the same thing. Um, and we've, we don't think about what we eat. We don't think about how we live. We don't think. And a lot of it is because we have become so mechanically inclined to how we live our lives that we just do. We're just operational sort of, sort of cogs in the wheel. And we don't realize that until you recognize that you're a cog and then you go, I don't want to be a cog anymore. I want to start <laughs> thinking differently. I need to talk to people like Joel. So, yeah, you know, what's interesting to me, uh, Mike, is, you know, we run a very formal intern and apprenticeship program here at, at Polyface, and uh, we've been doing this now for well over 20 years, and um, when we started, almost all of our folks were, you know, 18, 19, 20, they, they, they we, I mean, we had older ones, but, mm -hmm. but by far and away, the preponderance was, you know, quite young, and, and, uh, what we're seeing now is a, a dramatic shift in preponderance to um, 28 to 35 year olds. Yeah. Most of them are white collar professionals. They're five to eight years into their career, and they're burned out. You know, the statistic the statistic right now is circulating around the business world is that 80 percent of Americans hate their job. Wow. You know what a what a terrible thing to be in um, mm -hmm. in these situations, and and what a what a statement about our culture that as supposedly creative and innovative and you know Yankee ingenuity, you know all that that, that, that Americans you know we, we pride ourselves in that we can't create a workplace a vocational a vocational legacy that people can be proud of and enjoy. That's a that's a blight on 
on our on our creativity in my uh, in my estimation. No, you're absolutely right. And I, I told you before we got started with the podcast officially that my eldest just headed off to college this weekend. And, uh, you know, he initially wanted to do something in biology and then kind of changed to uh, criminal science and then or criminal justice and then sort of changed to undeclared. And, you know, he's, he's sort of in that in that mode of like, I'm not sure what I want to do. And, I, you know, we see this from the, the we've, we've heard this through the, about millennials. We've heard this about Generation Z and that so many kids are going off to college or wherever they happen to go to, and they're not sure what they want to do. And a lot of times people will say, well, it's because they're lazy or it's because they, you know, uh, they want something for nothing or whatever the case is. But I got another response. I think it's because they look around and they don't see anything that they want to do because the jobs that most people are doing just look absolutely miserable. I mean, it's not, it's not something that, you know, going to, there was a time I would say probably after uh, world war two, when, getting a good job that you could put in 20 years and, um, you know, bring home money and have some set aside for your grandkids and that kind of stuff that made a lot of sense. And it was worth the sacrifice of just doing the same thing over and over. But, um, you know, we're past that and we're at the point now where we, we don't want to be as automated as we are in our professions. We don't want to sit in front of a computer screen all day long. We want to have our hands in the, in the dirt or we want to have hands on stuff. And there are a lot of people who feel that way, but they also don't have a very clear avenue of how to do that and make a living. And, and there's also that, um, it's a stigma, you know, against, uh, just the regular kind of vocational jobs. And that's, like you said, that's something that we got to do away with. And we've got to get back to a place where, we we value the vocational work, um, the hands on stuff, the stuff that gets you dirty, just as much as we do, you know, the guys who are, you know, cranking out computer code. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've invented. I mean, th- think of think of terms that our culture has invented. We've invented the term, for example, teenager. You know, that that mm-hmm. word did not exist uh, uh, seventy years ago. That that's a very very new word, and and it was a it was necessitated, if you will, in the vocabulary, the reason we had to invent it was because we lost our ability to incorporate um, young people into the adult world. I mean, Buffalo Bill Cody was 13 when he went out west and and, uh, rode the Pony Express. He was 13 (laughs) years old, riding the Pony Express, carrying U.S. mail through hostile Indian country. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. What... What parent today would <laughs> would send their 13-year-old to the ends of the earth, to the frontier, to hostile, you know, Indian country to run U.S. mail on horse? Uh, uh, you know, the bar mitzvah is 12, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there's, I think there's an expectation of of childhood to 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 youth and young adulthood that's that's relatively seamless. I, I think that's the that's the idea. You, you know, you don't see, well, uh, so, so how do we, how do we make this, you know, uh, how do we incorporate these people? And now, now, of course, in our culture, if you want kids to work, that's considered child abuse. We have all these, you know, protective, protective laws. Uh, I mean, I run into people that tell me when they were growing up, for example, in Washington state and the apple orchards were coming in, um, Kids that were as young as uh, ten or eleven, uh, they, the the apple orchards would use the school buses in the summertime. Uh, imagine that <laughs> using public school buses for private business, right? And and they would simply publish their route like the ice cream uh, ice cream route through the through the city. And if you wanted to go earn some money to go to the you know um, Roy or see Roy Rogers on the matinee, um, you know you you just went out and met the bus. When it came, you out picked apples all day. You got cash in your pocket. You know, came home. Mm. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine today, uh, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen year old kids, yeah, um, doing that, yeah, for for spending money. And so, um, and so, what we're seeing is that the the burnout that used to happen. You know, we call it the midlife crisis. You know, in your forties, seems to now be happening at more like you know, between 30 and 34. And, and um, so this whole acceleration of discontent is, is quite uh, profound. The millennials, um, you know, the, the kind of the three words that characterize the millennials now is they want to care about something, 
they want to build community. This speaks to, you know, they don't see, this speaks to your idea. They don't see anything that they want to do. And then, you know, an inconvenience. They, and, and they want it now. Uh, they've grown up with video games and, and uh, you know, Angry Birds, and your icon is supposed to respond to you instantaneously. And, 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 and so, you know, this is the downfall. I mean, kids now, they, they, they get a job, and if they don't get a promotion in four months, oh, they must not love me here, you know, and, and they're gone. Um, instead of appreciating the persistence and, and the slog that comes with, with developing skill and mastery and, and those sorts of things. And so I, I think you're exactly right that, that, um, uh, that things, the, the acceleration of, um, of, of professional expectation uh, is, is real. And we, we've even... We've even marginalized uh, working with your hands and doing craft and, and physical work, you know, with the condescending terms. I, I said teenager we invented. We also invented blue collar and white mm-hmm. collar. Yep. Uh, to, to further, you know, and blue collar always said with a bit of, you know, a bit of curled lip mm-hmm. and a bit of condescension, you know. Yeah. Uh, not quite smart enough or good enough to, well, let me tell you what, the guy that, the guy that can to fix my plumbing problem <laughs> I <tell laughs> love that guy. <laughs> that that guy that guy is as important to me uh, as the guy who you know can uh, you know can fix the computer. Uh, in in the big scheme of things, I'd rather have my toilet working than the computer working. Mm-hmm. Um, and, <laughs> That's and, right. And so you know we we but we we just don't you know we just don't promote that uh, these days. I'm a I'm a big fan. Of young people, you know, taking a, a year or two, not going to college, just yeah. just uh, join the workforce, work for somebody, uh, find something you're interested in, and just do it, and and knock around a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I really, I've come to the conclusion that about forty percent of of um, of everyone who's in college probably shouldn't be there, or at least shouldn't be there yet. Right. Um, right. And, and we have correspondence college now. I mean, you, know, you get long distance learning. There's a lot of a lot of things that you can do that are that are complementary or in lieu of or or just an alternative. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just kind of give you an anecdotal example about the uh, the kids working. Yesterday, I was at a coffee shop, and there's this kid that that was behind the counter there. He's he's had to be about seven years old. Maybe he's just short for his age. I don't know, but he was he was a tiny guy, and uh, I thought maybe he was just hanging out with his mom or something along those lines. And the next thing I know, he's bringing sandwiches to, uh, you know, on trays to customers and he's bringing coffee out and he's doing, he's running, he's, you know, he's, he's a runner basically. He's bringing out the food. And I thought I got to call this kid out because I want to put him on social media and say this, what this kid's learning right now is going to have so many valuable lessons for him down the road. But then I caught myself because I thought, what if I get him in trouble or his parents in trouble or the business establishment in trouble because I'm pointing out a kid doing what kids ought to do. I don't think he was there, you know, under, uh, you know, against his will, you yeah. know, he's probably making a little bit of money sure. and he was enjoying it. But sure. uh, that's right. Yeah. I was just worried that what happens if I, if I mention something, is he going to get ratted out by somebody? So yeah. Isn't that, uh, isn't that a sad state of affairs that when you find a, a savvy, uh, what we call a bright eyed, bushy tailed self starter, mm-hmm. uh, that, that you can't even, you know, uh, whatever, uh, set them up as an example mm-hmm. of, of good things because there would be people who interpret that as exploitation and uh, abuse and all sorts of things. I mean, actually, you know, kids want to grow up and be like adults if, if they're not, if they're not damaged. Yeah. The, the only, the only kids who don't want to grow up and become adults are, are kids who have, for whatever reason, you know, been, uh, been messed up right. uh, in, in the in the course, but you know, in the natural scheme of things, kids want to grow up and be like mom and dad. Yeah, especially when mom and dad's doing something cool, you know. Yeah, um, that's right. So I mean, that's right. you know, this, this actually was a coffee shop that just opened up, and so you know, I can imagine that kids seeing this thing kind of start from nothing, all the you know, all the machines getting brought in, and everything just kind of building, and you know, that's that's pretty impressive. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, this this whole people walking away from Polyface Farms and having sort of a spiritual, I don't want to say a spiritual experience, maybe you could call it that, but definitely getting those spiritual lessons rooted in real life 
uh, examples, right? They would see this is what neighborly lo- looks, la- neighborliness right. looks like. This is what, you know, so on and so on. And, you know, all of that, that really, what the changes that you've made at Polyface actually begins in that, like you said, it really begins out of a, uh, a belief in certain principles that are spiritual that get applied to practical and then turn back around and become spiritual again, you know, for other people who witness that. And, uh, and so I think this is great. It's, you know, the, we talk about the sort of regenerative farming, you, you're kind of doing the same thing with, you know, how polyface itself is in existence, right? It's began with spiritual principles, became practical, turns around, becomes spiritual and nourishes that again. So I thought that was really cool. I just wanted to call that out. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, well, for sure. I mean, we, we, on our website, um, it really catches people's eyes when they say that if our bottom line is that we're in the, we're in the redemption business, healing the land, healing the community, healing the, uh, you know, the, the, the culture. And, uh, and, and so we, we take very seriously the fact that we are ambassadors. We are salt. We are light. We are, uh, you know, we are God's hands and feet, um, you know, stewarding, taking care of his, of his creation. And so that means, uh, that means that as as the sun uh, S U N as the sun shines on the on the earth, mm-hmm. um, it should be metabolizing more green material into biomass. I mean that's the return on investment, right? Uh, building soil, um, it, the immu- the immune function of everything, you know, plants, animals, ourselves, our immune function should be um, should be optimal, and this whole uh, you know, reliance, our, our orthodox reliance now on the, you know, the, the wellness, wellness comes out of a bottle or, or from a, you know, the end of a syringe. Um, no, you know, uh, th- this, even though it's a fallen world, and, and we get that it's a fallen world, and there are tornadoes and hurricanes and volcanoes and all that stuff, um, it, it, in its fallen state, um, it is still an extremely, extremely functional thing. For me, the best little uh, meta, uh, whatever metaphor for that is the Israelites. You know, God God sent them into the promised land, and he, fa- he very carefully defined their borders. You know, mm. from this mountain to this river to this mountain to, to this valley. Right. And and uh, and and then so so he says, here's your land. Here's where I'm going to bless you. The implication being, stay here. Don't go elsewhere. And then he says, be fruitful and multiply. Well. In today's thinking, we would say, "Well, that's a that's a recipe for famine." You know, how can you possibly have your land area defined mm-hmm. and then and then you know be fruitful and multiply? You know, without without some sort of a you know uh, until you get to five million people, you know, then quit or whatever. <laughs> you know, some right. sort of a, a boundary on that. You've set physical boundaries, but not you know uh, the other boundaries. And 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 to me, that is simply. Uh, that speaks to me saying God's intent is that as we interact with his creation, that we are to bring increased productivity, increased abundance to it. Um, not not, exer- not uh, exploiting it in a conquistador mentality, which, of course, you know, the, the, the conquistadors um, – you know, they, they they did a lot of things in the name of God, right? Uh, things that we would, were very uh, embarrassed about, and 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 truly, the history of civilization, uh, in more than not, is a history of ecological exploitation. Mm-hmm. Uh, civilizations leave the land worse than it was when they when they arrived, and and so you know, modern Americans who who care, who are thinking, uh, we. We look at that, and and it makes us very timid to participate, to interact with with creation, because, well, goodness, our our, our track record is not very good, and and so we practice what I call environmentalism by abandonment. The only way that I can uh, respond with integrity is to lock it up in a wilderness area, a state park, a roadless area, you know, uh, a national forest or something, and. And let's not desecrate it with human activity, human breath. You know, let's let's let's. Mm-hmm. Get, and and so we have environmentalism by abandonment. Whereas I would propose that we that we recognize our history, repent in sackcloth and ashes, turn 180 degrees, and say, okay, so why do I have this intellectual capacity? Why do I have this mechanical ability? Is it to rape and exploit, or 
Is it possible that it is actually to caress, to massage, to, to participate in a redemptive capacity that is very physical and, and, and visceral to show neighbors, to show people around God's design is really good and it works really cool. And if we come to it humbly and strategically seek to know his design, wow, look at the abundance it will, it, it will bring. And, and I'm not a name it, claim it, you know, prosperity gospel preacher by any means. But, but I, I do very much believe that God's intent is that our marriages are functional, that our families are functional, that our churches are functional, that our, that, that, that our, our physical that our, our lives are functional. Sure, we're going to get sick, and there's going to be, you know, tragedy and things, but, but you know, let, let's first, let's at least first uh, uh, wrestle with what is, what is God's plan A, his number one intent, his, his outworking of his order, his pattern, in, in, in the physical, you know, world. We... We wrestle with this, you know, as we memorize the catechism or struggle with doctrines, you know, and we have, we have elevated all of our spiritual discussions to, you know, theology and doctrines and, 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 all, and we wrestle with all that. But we don't wrestle with, well, should we use styrofoam at the potluck or could we use paper or better yet, go down to the Salvation Army thrift store and buy a bunch of uh, plates. And we'll just wash them, and we won't have anything to throw away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we we can't even have that discussion in our churches because if we did, we're suddenly branded, you know, a, a commie, pinko, liberal, gay, uh, earth worshiping, you know, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. I mean, that we we put these limits on ourselves that that kind of keep us boxed into, you know, don't break away, don't do anything different than what we've always done. Um, yeah, no, that's really great. That's great. So let's break this down then. So the the average suburbanite that's listening to the to this is going, okay, I'm starting to get some of this here. I'm getting a, a kind of a feel for what Joel's talking about, and and you know, yeah, I need to think differently about how I do how I do food, about how I you know what my kids' in, involvement and and actual activities that are beneficial to them are, and that kind of stuff. So let's let's break this down to the guy who's he's sitting on you know a quarter of an acre or half an acre of land, something like that, and he's living in suburban America, and he's like Joel, I. I feel you, and I want to make some changes. What can I do to start making some generational changes, some changes in my family that are going to have a generational impact? Oh, what a great question, and certainly one of my favorite ones. All right, so so you got to realize that the you know, the the hardest climate to change. We talk about climate change a lot today, but the hardest climate to change is the climate between our ears. Uh, <laughs> that's the hardest uh, climate to change. Once that's changed, then then the dominoing can occur. And so let me just throw out a few, just a few very practical, visceral things that, that a person can do. So, so one thing you can do is put a solarium on the south side of your house, uh, so at least if you're, you know, if you're north of Houston, Texas. Uh, but, but a solarium on the south side of your house, um, uh, now you can open up your windows in the wintertime, put a little uh, thermocouple in there with a fan every time the, the, the solarium gets above your house temperature, suck that solar uh, heat into the house, reduce your heat costs, and the solarium will grow your cabbage, lettuce, mescaline mix, radishes, and carrots all through the wintertime. You get passive heat, and you, get, you start growing food. Then, then, you, then you, um, uh, y- in addition to that, you begin, um, maybe you get two chickens. You know, you, you've got a dog, a cat, well, you know, mm-hmm. um, Two chickens are far more functional than a dog and a cat, and um, and and they can be they can then eat your kitchen scraps. Now we don't put any garbage in. Now we don't add to the waste stream. We recycle our kitchen scraps through a couple of three or four chickens. The chickens lay eggs for us. Now we don't have to buy eggs, and we've and we've closed this this cycle. So we don't have a garbage stream, and we're starting to get some of our own food. Then obviously one of the next steps is take a little corner, a piece there, and start doing some gardening. Uh, I'm such a believer in, if you want to see a, a, a transformation of a child, um, you get their hands in the dirt, get them growing something, and, and viscerally uh, participating in, in the awesomeness of life 
you don't have to do much garden. You don't have to plant a tomato very much mm-hmm. to realize there's something bigger than me. And, and, and we're so, um, you know, egocentric in the way we live, the way we think. Everything revolves around me. And, uh, uh, and, and so I, I think that the growing something uh, it is just therapeutic. It's, it, it's, it's grounding for children, for families, uh, something bigger than me. Now, what this means is you might have to make a choice. You know, you can't go to every soccer game there is. You can't be involved in every little league program, ballet program, whatever. And I'm not saying those are evil. All I'm suggesting is, I said, the climate between your ears. And so, and so you know, the definition of insanity is, uh, you know, doing the same thing, expecting different results. All right, well, <laughs> you're going to have to do some different things. And, and you have to turn off Netflix, and you're going to have to, uh, you know, the kids aren't going to have video games maybe, and they're not going to be involved in every little thing there is. But, but you're going to substitute that with the awesomeness and the, the, the discovery of worms and spiders and bugs and, and plants and growing things. You're going to work in the kitchen. You're going to take that stuff. You're going to can it. You're, you ultimately cannot have a food system of integrity that's not ultimately home-centric. So now we're not going to be buying takeout and we're not going to be buying packaged, you know, DiGiorno's frozen pizza and SpaghettiOs. We're going to actually be getting unprocessed food at the farmer's market, from the back garden, from the farmer down the street that we're going to discover because we're not going to soccer games anymore or not as many, and we're going to take that time and invest it in finding our our local food chain that's going to have much better uh, nutrition in it and and we're going to be, we're going to come home and we're going to be home centric in our preparation our uh, processing our packaging now there's not a big packaging stream when you can you reuse the bottles over and over you don't have a garbage can full of of, of plastic wrappers now now uh, you know the the husband and the kids don't have to carry the trash out to the side of the street all the time see how see how little trash you can generate instead of how much you can, you can use a, a dehydrator. You can dry stuff. You can make fruit leather. Uh, and, and all this can be done. The, the chemistry, the fractions, the educational component of quarter teaspoons and, and baking soda and vinegar that, that happen in a kitchen, this is, this is like a lab, uh, math, science. The, the whole thing turns into uh, this, this, you know, <laughs> this um, uh, womb of education. And, and so... A lot of what I'm describing is about, you know, is about becoming home centric. In our culture, we have moved from a place where where life was fundamentally home centric, and and what we did away from home was uh, ancillary or simply augmented. Um, you know, it was a subsidiary of home. To now, where home is subsidiary. And life happens outside the home, and essentially home is a pit stop. That has to invert. That has to invert so home centricity becomes the focal point of our lives, and everything else should should augment or encourage or, or you know act as a as a, a supplement to home, to home centricity. Then, of course, you can put a beehive on the roof. <laughs> You can put on a you know a patio garden hanging in vertical plants. Uh, you can build. You can put a cistern, catch all your rainwater. Now your now your water doesn't go down the, the street or down into the uh, sewer system. Now you have water to grow plants, and uh, you, know, you can put in a little uh, fish pond with cattails and run your gray water out there and, um, and 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 grow your own fish. You can have uh, rabbits. You can you know you can do all sorts of cool stuff. Perennials, berries edible landscape, you know, it doesn't take any more room or effort to grow an edible tree than an inedible tree. <laughs> so just right. so just gradually gradually switch your yard from an edible tree from et, from inedibles to edibles, from ornamentals to edibles. And uh, and then you can have your apple tree and your grape vines and and you can make your own, you know, juice and and, and you you begin uh, just Finding the wonder and the the joy of 
of, of lying down with your beloved at night, knowing that the larder, you know, we don't even use the word anymore, the <laughs> larder. You know, yeah. uh, 80 years ago, if you went to a city and said, where's the food? They said, well, it's in, it's in the larder, right? <laughs> well, today, the larder is at Costco. And, and, what I'm suge- and what I'm suggesting is that there is a dramatic spiritual and emotional change that happens when you lie down with your beloved and you're proximate to your larder that you have, you have put together you know what's there, you know what it came from, and, and you know that come a snowstorm, come a hurricane, you've got this larder full of, of, of dehydrated, canned uh, 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 stuff that you put together, and you can be at peace. Wow. That's great. That's absolutely great. I'll share one more anecdotal story, and then i got one last question for you. My sister called me, or actually I called her uh, about a month ago, I guess now, and uh, we were chatting, and she still lives out uh, near my grandparents, and she's about 10 years younger than I am. My granddad's getting up into his 80s now. And uh, she told me that he, he brought over uh, some, a jar of, of, of canned beef you know, that they had, that they had, that they had, had as some deer, some venison. And uh-huh. he said, hey, cook, cook this up and, and let me know what you think about it. So they opened it up. It's a little, little brown. And, uh, and you know, she, she fries it up and they eat it and everything tasted fine. Well, a day or two goes by and our granddaddy asked her about it, says, Hey, what'd you think about that meat that I gave you? Did you eat it? She said, Oh yeah, we ate it. You know, it was, it looked kind of, kind of old, but it tasted really good. And she said, he said, well, when do you think that, uh, we can that? She said, wow. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe last year, maybe the year and a half ago. He said, 1987. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, uh, yeah. you know, she, yeah. he said, he said, I, I, the reason I didn't tell you before is because you wouldn't have eaten it, but I wanted you to understand just yeah. how long you can, you know, prep your yeah. own stuff and keep it good for. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's, that's still, you know, it's still good for you. So funny story, you know, she, I, I, you know, I was thinking maybe three or four years old, 1987. I mean, that was before she was born, I think. So yeah, yeah. crazy. 30, 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Right, so last, last, last question I got for you. So you're doing, you're making a lot of changes in people's lives, uh, or you're helping people to see something that's making change in changes in their lives. And, uh, and you're doing something that's, I think is going to have generational impacts on agriculture and how we think about food and all that kind of stuff. And I always just like to ask guys who are in a space that's sort of unique is what is this doing for your heart as a man? You know, the, the God gave you a particular kind of heart, a masculine heart. And I, I just wanted to know, like, how does this, how does this impact you as you know, Joel Salatin, knowing that this is what you do every day and this is the kind of impact that you're having on people? Oh, well, um, it, it's actually quite, uh, oh, quite humbling, quite stunning. Uh, and and you, you realize that this, this platform has an awesome responsibility. And uh, you, you are in the legacy building business. And what kind of legacy? You know, what... What's going to be written on your tombstone? How many, you know, who's going to come to your funeral? And mm-hmm. those, those kinds of very, uh, uh, I mean, I, I just, in, in my devotions this morning, you know, I read about, I'm, I'm in uh, Genesis. I just love Genesis. You know, the story mm-hmm. is so profound. And, and uh, you know, when Jacob is dying and he blesses uh, Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh, you know, when they come. And, and, and you just, man, you just think of that that legacy of that man. And, and, he, and he, you know, he was not the best man in the world, you know. But 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 look at look at his life, yeah. and um, and you know the, the patriarch, and uh, and I think that that is, you know, isn't that the desire of, of a man's heart to uh, to reach past the grave, if you will, mm-hmm. um, to where generations will say, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, the the mm-hmm. the the, the the, the ministry of the um, the the outlook of the practice of uh, the craft of yeah, I mean yeah, I'm, I'm 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 I don't want to denigrate it but but you know what I'm saying you, yeah, yeah. You're, you're looking back to that and uh, uh, goodness you know people who are in craft I, I mean I think of I think of uh, tools uh, for me it's you know dad was Dad was a, a, a great craftsman. I am not. I'm totally functional. You know, I can't make a 90 degree uh, cut on a board if you paid me. <laughs> uh, minor, you know, minor 89 or 88. Mm-hmm. Uh, dads, were, dads were perfect. He was a journeyman pattern maker at Delco Remy before World War II, and he went off to fly planes in the Navy. But, um, 
but you know his tools in the shop are almost like a shrine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 you know to think that you know I remember growing up uh, playing with those on the shop floor as he worked up on the vice. You know, and 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 we still have some of those tools today. And now you know my son has grown up with those tools. And now I'm I'm sharing those tools with my grandkids. You know, we're talking about you know uh, an eighty year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, reaching back in time, yeah. uh, that that is a powerful. That's a powerful thought, and I think it's. We tend to think of heirlooms as you know heirloom furniture. Mm-hmm. Heirloom, you know, we, we think of the women. You know, women are big on this. Uh, yeah. The heirloom. You know, this was your grandmother's, and they're the ones that keep the records and all that. Mm-hmm. But you know, but you know, we men, we men are, uh, you know, can make heirlooms too, mm-hmm. and um, and and they're they're a different type, but they're they're no less profound and no less reaching past the grave, reaching past the, our, our lives to bless and touch and, and anchor and anchor uh, future generations. Very powerful legacy. Wow. Yeah, and you, you, you absolutely have, you, you're in the business of, of building a legacy. I mean, we all are, you know, uh, in one way or another. And uh, But yours is going to be far-reaching, I have no doubt. And look, I, I want to tell you again, I appreciate you so much coming on this podcast. I know the guys who are listening to this are going to get so much out of it. And I want everybody to head over to polyfacefarms.com, check out what Joel Salton's up to, check out his books. And uh, and look, I hope to get out there and visit the farm someday. I want to see this thing, get my hands in the dirt, and, uh, and see what you got going on. We'd, we'd love to have you very much. We'd be privileged. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, there you have it, men. I'd love to know what you thought about the episode. Feel free to reach out to me on any of my social networks. Also, don't forget to leave us a review at iTunes. You can do that by going to wolfandiron.com forward slash iTunes or from your mobile device. Until next time, keep your powder dry and may a fair wind be always in your sails.